um, she had just had her daughter Lisa and um, we'll just move on from there all right mm. at the same time I started to pay so she's talking about just having a, a, a child a daughter and having the ability to stay at home for a while and just sort of calm down from the the performing life um, it caused her to pay closer attention to certain things and so we'll start from I'll just read a, a sentence back one day on a flight between Los Angeles and New York I worked out that there would be 37 people not including my own family dependent on me to get on stage that night in order that they would get paid I began to understand the responsibilities I had at the same time I started to pay closer attention to what was happening in my country especially to the advances my own people were making with the civil rights movement I had not made a connection between the fights I had and any wider struggle for justice because of how I was raised the Wayman way was to turn from prejudice and to live your best as best you could as if acknowledging the existence of racism in itself was a kind of defeat that was what I did after Curtis so if you don't know where Curtis is I I um, implore you to go back to number one and listen from the start because it really gives context to um, what's going on with her right now but Curtis is a school that she got turned down from because she was black even though she was amazing and an incredible pianist and performer they turned her down because she was black all right as if acknowledging the existence of racism was in itself a kind of defeat that was what I did after Curtis I turned away from the disgrace I felt after being refused the scholarship and pursued my ambition from a different angle of course I knew discrimination existed but I didn't allow myself to admit it had any effect on me like anyone with half a brain I had followed the developments of the civil rights movement from its early days with Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King jr. and the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955 watching the way the protests in Montgomery grew from one black woman's determination to sit just once in the front of the public bus to a citywide black boycott of public services a boycott which survived for well over a year in the face of brutal intimidation I understood for the first time the power of collective action but I didn't make the jump to thinking that I had a part to play in what was happening through knowing black leaders as friends right from the early days in New York I was always aware of the vanguard of black artists and thinkers and what they were concerned with but I wasn't an activist in, in any sense I heard the conversations flow around me at Langston's or in the blue note with Jimmy Baldwin I laughed at the political jokes at the village gate and a political awareness seeped into me without my having even to think about it but I wasn't taking the trouble to educate myself in an organized way where would I find the time it would take a special kind of friend really to pull me into the ideas of the black movement and force me to accept that I had to take politics seriously the special friend was Lorraine Hansberry the first black writer to have a hit on a hit Broadway play Raisin in the Sun of 1958 and the person who first took me out of myself and allowed me to see the bigger picture I was introduced to Lorraine in the mid 60s but I only got to know her well after I moved to Mount Vernon Lorraine lived about 10 miles away in Quilton on the Hudson River we started to visit each other all the time and became firm friends she was Lisa's godmother and gave her a beautiful silver Tiffany hairbrush and a comb for her christening present although Lorraine was a girlfriend a friend of my own rather than one shared with Andy we never talked about men or clothes or such inconsequential things when we got together it was always Marx Lenin the revolution real girls talk Lorraine was most definitely an intellectual and saw civil rights as only one part of the wider racial and class struggle she understood that I felt separated from what was going on but told me over and over again that like it or not I was involved in the struggle by the fact of being black it made no difference whether I admitted it or not the fact was still true Lorraine was truly dedicated although she loved beautiful things she denied them herself 
she denied herself them because that would distract her from the struggle, which was her life. She wore no makeup except for lipstick and she only had five dresses. I'm pretty the way I am, she'd say. I don't need lots of clothes. I guess if you call, <laughs> if y'all been listening for a while, you might know my whole outfit, all my little outfits that I'd be throwing on and earrings and stuff. It's just a few of them. Not to say I'm like Lorraine and all, because sometimes I do wear lipstick too. Anyway, this isn't about me. This is what Nina's talking about. So I'm shutting up now. Lorraine started off my political education. And through her, I started to think about myself as a black person in a country run by white people and a woman in a world run by men. I realized that I, I realized I was ignorant and had much to learn, but my teachers from Lorraine onwards were the cream of the movement, Stokely Carmichael, Godfrey Cambridge, and many, many others, most of whom I would never meet face to face, but in their writings, speeches, or just their actions. Like Rosa Parks, when she sat in front of the bus in Montgomery and refused to move, no matter what, they pointed the way forward for me. Like so many people dedicated to the struggle for freedom in America, Lorraine died before her time. Cancer killed her when she was just 34, only a couple years after Lisa's christening. When she was getting ready to die, she asked for me, and I went down to the hospital with a record player. I played In the Evening by the Moonlight for her, and she raised her hands in front of her face and said, Nina, I don't know what's happening to me. They say I'm not going to get better, but I must get well. I must go down south. I've been a revolutionary all my life, but I've got to go down there to find out what kind of revolutionary I am. She never got out of that hospital. And the next time I played in the evening by the moonlight was at her funeral service in New York, and I didn't cry. I was beyond crying by that time. Before she died, Lorraine had been working on a new play, to be young, gifted, and black. I took the title and I wrote a song in the memory of Lorraine and so many others. To be young, gifted, and black. Oh, what a lovely, precious dream. To be young, gifted, and black. Open your heart to what I mean, do, 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 do. you know what? I'm going to read the rest of the words to you. To be young, gifted, and black. Oh, what a lovely, precious dream. To be young, gifted, and black. Open your heart to what I mean. In the whole world, you know, there are billions of boys and girls who are young, gifted, and black. And that's a fact. In early 1963, as I nursed Lisa, all that was still to come, Dr. King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference was deep into another campaign in Birmingham, Alabama, using the issue of desegregation of the downtown lunch counters to politicize and educate the whole community. On Good Friday, Dr. King was arrested while praying in the streets of Birmingham. At the same time, I set out for Chicago to play play a date at the Sutherland Lounge. Dr. King was writing his famous letter from Birmingham jail while I was on stage. When I got back to Mount Vernon, Lorraine called to point out the comparison and asked, what are you doing for the movement while, it, while its leaders are stuck in jail, Nina? Later, Dr. King was released and soon afterward, the city of Birmingham gave in to the SCLC's demands. I thought an important victory had been won. And when a little while later, President Kennedy announced he was going to present a new civil rights bill to Congress, it seemed like another one was on its way. The president's announcement was on June 11th. The very next night, while Kennedy was on TV talking about the moral crisis in America, Medgar Evers, a field secretary for the NAACP in Jackson, Mississippi, was shot to death on the steps of his home. I heard the news with disgust, but it seemed like just one more bitter news story at the time when there were already too many. At the trial of the white man accused of Megger Evers' murder, the governor of Mississippi walked into the courthouse, shook hands with the man in the dock. I noted this at the time, but I didn't react to it. 
I was still turning the other cheek like I'd been taught. What I didn't appreciate was that while Megger Evers, Megger Evers' murder was not the final straw for me, it was the match that lit the fuse. In September, I started to prepare myself for our tour since Lisa's birth. I was to start a week at the Village Gate on the 20th of the month and then fly to Los Angeles for further concerts. In Mount Vernon, we had a little apartment built over the garage, which was my private hideaway, where I went to practice and prepare for forthcoming performances. I was sitting there in my den on the 15th of September when the news came over the radio that somebody had thrown dynamite into the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, in Birmingham, Alabama, while black children were attending a Bible study class. Four of them, Denise McNair, Cynthia Wesley, Carol Robertson, and Annie Mae Collins had been killed. Later that day was the rioting which followed. Birmingham police shot another black kid and a white mob pulled a young black man off his bicycle and beat him to death out in the street. It was more than I could take and I sat dumbstruck in my den like St. Paul on the road to Damascus. All the truths that had been denied for myself for so long rose up and slapped me in the face. The bombing of the little girls in Alabama and the murder of Megger Evers were like final pieces of a jigsaw that made no sense until you had fitted the whole thing together. I suddenly realized what it was to be black in America in 1963. But it wasn't an intellectual connection of the type that Lorraine had been repeating to me over and over again. It came as a rush of fury, hatred, and determination. In church language, the truth entered, entered me and came through. I went down to the garage and got a load of tools and junk together and took them up to my apartment. Andy came in an hour later and saw the mess and asked me what I was doing. My explanation didn't make sense because the words were all tumbled in a rush. I couldn't speak quickly enough to release the torrents inside my head. He understood though, and was still enough of a cop to see that I was trying to make a zip gun, a homemade pistol. I had it in my mind to go out and kill someone. I didn't know who, but someone I could identify as being in some way, in the way of my people getting some justice for the first time in 300 years. And he didn't try to stop me. But he just stood there for a while and said, Nina, you don't know anything about killing. The only thing you got is music. He left me alone while I calmed down enough to think straight. The idea of fighting for the rights of my people, killing for them if that came to that, didn't disturb me too much. Even back then when I wasn't convinced that nonviolence could get us what we wanted, but Andy was right. I knew nothing about killing and I did know about music. I sat down at my piano. An hour later, I came out of my apartment with the sheet music from Mississippi Goddamn in my hand. It was my first civil rights song, and it erupted out of me quicker than I could write it down. I knew then that I would dedicate myself to the struggle of black justice, freedom, and equality under the law for as long as it took until our battles were won. Once I got inside the civil rights movement, I found out that many people already thought of me as a political artist, a protest singer because I used to talk about civil rights on the stage sometimes, praising the Freedom Riders or asking if there was anyone from the SNCC announced SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinated Committee in the house. And if there was, I got them to stand up so all those who were doing nothing whilst these people busted fighting for their rights felt good and guilty. But I didn't consider myself involved. I was just spurring them on as best I could from where I sat on the stage, an artist separate somehow. That's how I felt, coming as I did from a classical background. Nightclubs were dirty, making records was dirty, popular music was dirty, and to mix all of that with politics seemed senseless and demeaning. And until songs like Mississippi Goddamn burst out of me, I had musical problems as well. How could you take the memory of a man like Megger Evers and reduce all of that he was into a three and a half minute simple tune? That was the musical side of it I shied away from. I didn't like protest music because a lot of it was just so simple and unimaginative. It stripped the dignity, the dignity away from the people it was trying to celebrate. 
But Alabama church bombings and the murder of Megger Evers stopped that argument with Mississippi goddamn. I realized that there was no turning back. I went up to New York and planned and sang the song in public for the first time at the village gate. It brought the place down and I got the same reaction whenever I sang it. We released it as a single and it sold well except in the South where we had trouble with distri distribution. The excuse was profanity, goddamn. But the real reason was obvious enough. A dealer in South Carolina sent the whole crate back to our office with each one snapped in half. I laughed because it meant that we were getting through. In some states, the distributors bleeped out the word goddamn changed the wording on the sleeve and released it as a title of Mississippi star, 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 exclamation point. After the murder of Megger Evers, the Alabama bombing of the Miss the Alabama bombing and the Mississippi goddamn, the entire direction of my life shifted. And for the next seven years, I was driven by civil rights and the hope of black revolution. I was proud of what I was doing and proud to be part of a movement that was changing history. It made what I did for a living something much more worth worthwhile. I had started singing it because something much more, I'm sorry, I had started singing it because it was a way of learning, of earning more money. Then fame came along and I began to enjoy the trappings of success, but after a while, even they weren't enough. And I got fulfillment outside of music from my husband, my daughter, my home. That changed when I started singing for the movement because I justified what I was doing to myself and to the world outside, I could finally answer Mama's great unasked question. What do you sing out in the world? Why do you sing out in the world when you could be praising God? I needed to be able to answer that question because although being a performing artist, although being a performing artist sounded like something grand and wonderful, up to then, it felt like just another job. I didn't feel like an artist because the music I played to which I dedicated my artistry was so inferior. That was why I put so much of my classical background as I could into the songs. I performed, mm -mm, I'm sorry, and I missed some punctuation there. That was why I put as much of my classical music as I could into the songs I performed and the music I recorded to give it at least some depth and quality. The world of popular music was nothing compared to the classical world. You didn't have to work as hard. The audience were too easily pleased. And all they were interested in was the delivery of their lyrics. It seemed like nothing. It seemed like a nothing world to me. And I didn't have much respect for popular audiences because they were so music musically ignorant. As I became more involved in the movement, this attitude of of mine toward my audiences changed because I admired that they were achieving for my people so much that the level of their musical education didn't come to mind anymore. They gave me respect too, not only for my music, which they loved, but because they understood the stand I was making. They knew I was making sacrifices and running risks just like they were, and we were all in it together. Being a part of the struggle made me feel so good. My music was dedicated to a purpose more important than classical music's pursuit of excellence. It was dedicated to the fight for freedom and the historical destiny of my people. I felt a fierce pride when I thought about what we were doing all together. So if the movement gave me nothing else, it gave me self-respect. It was at this time in the mid 60s that I first began to feel the power and spirituality I could connect with when I played in front of an audience. I'd been performing for 10 years, but it was only at this time that I felt a kind of state of grace come upon me during those occasions when everything fell into place. At such times, I would give a concert that everyone who witnessed it would remember it for years, and they would go home afterward knowing that something very special had happened. Those moments were very difficult for a performer to explain. It's like being transported in church. Something descends upon you and you are gone taken away by a spirit that's outside of you. I can only think of one comparison. When I went to a bullfight in Barcelona once, not knowing what to expect, I sat in the sun drinking vodka, waiting for it to begin. And when the bull got out and they killed him, I threw up from the mixture of alcohol and shock. It was a Sunday afternoon bloodletting, a real bloodletting. Back in trying a revival time, at revival time, people would 
come through and shout and carry on and foam at the mouth. We call it a bloodletting, but it wasn't. Not a real bloodletting like it was that afternoon at the bullfight. I realized that the Spanish people were not much different from black people in America in the Holy Roller Church and the songs performed by the Flamingo musicians were similar to those performed by my people in churches in the Black South. All rhythm and emotion. The only difference was they actually killed the bull in Spain, whereas in America, they had a revival meeting where the death and sacrifice were only symbolic. And, but it was the, t it was the same thing, the same sense of being transformed of celebrating something deep. It was real. And I had the ability to make people feel on a deep level from up there on that stage. It's difficult to describe because it's not something you can analyze to get near, to get near what it's about. You have to play it. And when you've caught it, when you've got the audience hooked, you always know because it's like electricity hanging in the air. I began to feel it happening and it seemed to me like some mass hypno hypnosis. Like I was hypnotizing the entire audience to feel a certain way. I was a treador mesmerizing the bull and I could turn around and walk away turning my back on this huge animal which I knew would do nothing because I had it under my complete control. And like they did with the treadors, toradors. I know I'm pronouncing that wrong, sorry y'all. People came to see me because they knew I was playing close to the edge and one day I might fall and they'd be there to catch me. This was how I got my reputation as a live performer because I went out from the mid 60s onwards determined to get every audience to enjoy my concerts the way I wanted them to. And if they raised and if they resisted at first, I had all the tricks to bewitch them with. Bewitched, bothered, and bewildered. Oops, wrong artist. Am I? Do you guys know that song? After one quart of brandy. Do -do 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 -do. It's Ella. If you don't know it, you should listen to Ella Fitzgerald. It's good. Bewitched, bothered, and bewildered. I'm getting back to the story now because that doesn't have anything to do with what I'm reading. I know it all sounds a little Californian and weird, but it wasn't like that at all. I had technique and I used it to cast a spell over an audience. I would start with a song to create a certain mood, which I carried into the next song and then on through the third until I created a certain climax of feeling. By then, they would be hypnotized. To check, I'd stop and do nothing for a moment. And I would hear absolute silence. I got them. I put a spell on you because you're mine. It was always an uncanny moment. It was as if there was a power source somewhere that we were all plugged into. And the bigger the audience, the easier it was, as if each person supplied a certain amount of the power. And as I moved on from clubs into bigger halls, I learned to prepare myself thoroughly. I go to the empty hall in the afternoon and walk around and see where the people were going to be sitting, how close they'd be to me at the front and how far away in the back whether the seats got closer together or further apart, how big the stage was, how the lights were positioned, the microphones, where they were going to hit. Everything, I was especially careful of microphones. Taking the trouble to find one that worked for me and throwing away those that didn't. So by the time I got on stage, I knew exactly what I was doing that night. Before the important concerts, I would practice alone for hours at a time so long sometimes that my arms would seize up completely. There was one period when I was so dissatisfied with the drummers that I decided not to use them anymore. So I sat down for days and trained my left hand like a drum. Just as I mastered it, my arm went paralyzed from all the work it had done. Other times I'd fall asleep at the piano and Andy would have to come and put me to bed. I made sure the musicians in my bands understood every detail, the way they were to play and when we rehearsed regularly, but the vital thing was that they emphasized, I'm sorry, that they empath, empathy, empathy, empathized with me and understood the way I was likely to go on stage. My ideal musician was Al Shackman, but there were others who were almost as wonderful. 
and those that weren't got fired on day one. My bands knew the repertoire of songs I could choose from, but I never gave them the set list until the very last minute. Sometimes as we walked out on the stage, I'd hand them the set list because the songs I played each night depended on the mood I caught from the audience, the hall, and my preparations throughout the day. When I walked out to play, I was super sensitive and keenly aware of the crowd. I tried to play for myself and have a good time and hope the audience would get pulled into that, as if, like my musicians, they were an extension of me for the time that the concert lasted. Trouble in mind, I'm blue. Doo -doo -doo. But I won't be blue always. Sun is gonna shine in my back door someday. Doo -doo -doo. Trouble in mind, it's true. I have almost lost my mind. Never had so much trouble in my long life before. Do, do, do. I'm going on down to the river. Gonna get me a rocking chair. And if the Lord don't help me, I'm gonna rock on away from there. Ooh, do, do. Trouble in mind, I'm blue, but I won't be blue always. Sun gonna shine in my back door someday, someday, someday. Thank you for joining me.